red and purple team exercises may require several tools. Some custom tools, command and control services, as well as some lateral movement tools as well. That's why we normally develop our own tool sets, or sometimes we repurpose the open source alternatives. Whenever we use the known tools, we always have issues with EDRs or antivirus systems or other security controls. That's why I needed to develop my own tool sets. Patek is one of those. Patek is a purple team CD toolkit I released last month. Simply read team exercises are not so different than penetration testing. However, the main difference is the TTPs. We need to make these threat intelligence led penetration testing just like a real life activity. That's why we call it adversary simulation. Red team exercises are simply designed to emulate the adversaries and their tactics, techniques, and procedures. We call it sometimes tradecraft as well. That's the main difference between penetration testing and red team. Different types of penetration testing or red team also have different colors. Purple team is a type of exercise which involve defense teams as well as offense teams. And that's the main motivation of why I develop attack. SANS has a definition for red teaming. And it says that red teaming is the process of using tactics, techniques, and procedures to emulate a real world threat with the goals of training and measuring the effectiveness of people, process, and technology used to defend an environment. That's why we need to simulate those tools or techniques practically as well as safe. A long run of red team starts with the trade intelligence report. Based on the report or the data supplied, we prepare a scenario or a list of scenarios. And we try to get an approval. When we seek for approval, we also receive rules of engagement. That means we need to follow some certain rules to make this exercise safe for everyone. Therefore, we need to build an advisory network, a bad guys network on a cloud service or out of the organization somewhere. This also requires some development and building capability because some of the rules of engagements are highly sensitive. For example, do not expose sensitive data do not exploit any software or do not touch these systems. These kind of rules must be followed for the safer exercises. That's why we need to implement some additional encryption or some certain controls or scope items to those development uh, requirements. This makes us a kind of a programmer as well. Almost all red team exercises uh, require some custom code, not only for initial execution, bypassing controls, adding additional safeguards to make this exercise safe, as well as making sure that the target is what we seek. When we deploy the attack, we can use several different techniques, sometimes phishing, sometimes just a cloud access, unauthorized access, sometimes we directly exploit a certain vulnerability publicly available, or sometimes we just do some additional uh, access, or sometimes we use a bridge principle. For example, what if adversary has some sort of access to a certain environment? And from there, we can start lateral movement. There are different ways of deploying an attack. And on the long run, we perform several different attacks, several different simulations to achieve our objectives. We call it also actions uh, or uh, hands-on as well. This timeline based on a kill chain. Several red teams use mitra attack as a kind of kill chain reference, but also like it Martin and uh, some other uh, kill chain alternatives are in the wild as well. In a red team exercise, starting with threat intelligence and planning phases to delivery as well as remediation phases, 
it will take up to six months. Therefore, we use command and control server. We maintain this access for a certain period, just like the adversaries, because some adversaries may also stay in an organization up to four months. Let's assume that we have four targets here. These targets must connect to our command and control systems in an encrypted heartbeat. Otherwise, the defense teams or network-based security controls would easily identify these heartbeats, which, which means communications between the compromised laptops or systems and our servers. That's why we have some layers. In this slide, I will explain those layers. Sometimes we use redirectors as a kind of distraction, as well as avoiding secret control issues. For example, Jack's system is compromised by us, but the communication between Jack and the redirector will be also exposed to the defense teams. That's why we may lose our command and control server. To avoid this kind of issues, we generally use redirectors, sometimes more than um, a dozen. Sometimes we use just a serverless code there, serverless applications as a redirector, or some cheap systems deployed as VPS, virtual private server, and running as a reverse proxy. It depends on our deployment type. If it is a cloud native adversary simulation, we generally use redirectors running as functions serverless applications. Those redirectors also point to our reverse proxies, not directly to our command and control servers. The reason behind of it is even the serverless applications may be compromised. Moreover, the C2 software we use will be always unstable. Most of the open source command and control servers in the wild are unstable because they normally do a lot of different things. Sometimes they try to ex exploit a system. Sometimes they try to inject a certain code to a remote process, or sometimes they try to exfiltrate data. All these actions are highly important as well as dangerous. At least they are classified as dangerous. And that's why AV, antivirus or EDR, endpoint uh, response or uh, detection or prevention systems, they react and they try to stop it. And just because of this, we may lose implants, which are the malicious software we run on the victim side. On the server side, this may have an also impact. Some implant connections will be malformed, transformed or broken. That's why sometimes we lose the C2 server as well. This uh, service will die or we may need to restart the service. Or sometimes we need to debug this service as well. Reverse proxy is there as a kind of transition for us. While the traffic is landing, we can easily see what we have exposed and how we can hide the C2 as well. In addition, some of the C2 alternatives, even uh, commercial ones such as Kovan Strike, had also security vulnerabilities. So it's not a great idea to expose them in the wild. Those reverse proxies will be HA proxy, Apache or Nginx. It depends on your deployment. And finally, we may have different C2s. In a normal red team exercise, we generally use at least two command and control server types. Cobalt Strike is the most popular one. But there are also several other popular uh, C2 alternatives as well. One of those is a Covenant. Another one is Silent Trinity. Metasploit or Push C2 or PowerShell Empire, they are also known, but we generally don't use them because they are highly signature and well known. So they may expose us directly. However, because of the exercise requirements, we may need to deploy them to the environment. That's why we may have multiple C2s to simulate the adversary. If adversary, the threat actor, has used Metasploit, we need to use Metasploit for a realistic simulation. That means Metasploit is a part of our environment regardless. Then we will be 
connecting to those command and control servers through another trusted channel. If we go to the hands-on page, which means the actions on objectives or um, just interactive stage, we need to use another C2. If we use our current C2 setup, probably we will lose more than a few redirectors. We will expose our payloads or some certain things that could be used by the defense teams to stop the traffic. Blocking a website, yes, that's a problem. But blocking a traffic based on a certain pattern would also kill all the malware there. To avoid this kind of situation, we also use another C2 type. Different types of traffic, different HTTP or HTTPS or another protocol. So simply differentiating to malware. If one of those is exposed, we will lose Jack's system, for example, but Jane, Bob, or Alice will be still alive as a kind of um, recovery for us. Interactive proxy also need some additional features such as faster response time. If we use faster response time in our uh, long haul uh, or long-term command and control servers, that's probably uh, a kind of end of story of uh, our red team because probably uh, our long-term C2 will be easily identified because of the beacon uh, ratio. We generally use once, maybe twice uh, connection per day. As a solution, interactive proxy is generally deployed to another environment, another type of function, another type of C2, another type of protocol. If the normal environment is using HTTP, this could be, for example, just WebSocket or WebRTC or just DNS. It's up to the environment as well as adversary we simulate. Patak is developed to respond actually the WebSocket requirement. Moreover, Patak is giving a kind of real-time log communication. That's why I prefer to use it in hands-on section as it is also highly unstable. If it fails, it fails. I wouldn't lose all the implants or the infrastructure. I would only lose the interactive setup. So I will fork another one and start the process again. As normally I use Patak in purple team scenarios, I also have a hand on the client side as well. Patak is a word. It's a Klingon insult, meaning something like weirdo. The right pronunciation is out there as well as my pronunciation is different. Uh, let's hear it from the guy. I hope it is uh, audible. C2 Matrix. This is a really great project, and it gives you a lot of options to explain all the C2s. There are several different C2 alternatives, and this alternative, um, this project, really assists you to find the right C2 for your exercise. But again, trade actors also prefer to use some certain C2s as well. For example, Cobalt Group would also use Cobalt Strike as a C2. Or another trade actor may prefer to use Metasploit and PowerShell Empire. In this case, you may need to choose the same uh, C2 channels. This comes with a defect actually. If you use the well-known channels like that or well-known C2 alternatives, generally you get identified very fast. As a solution, you may use something not exactly exposed or highly customized to achieve your objectives. And meanwhile, on the way, using the other signature, uh, signatured or uh, identified C2s on the way. For example, uh, getting access to the Swift environment and demonstrating the access and achieving the flag, and then going back and establishing an Empire agent on a certain system. As installing Empire or Metasploit or Cobalt Strike will ring some bells on the defense side, they will also search for that adversary, that threat actor. 
that's a really good response uh, opportunity for you as well because the C2 as well as your logging environment will also give you visibility about the blue team response types as well as their effectiveness. That's why there's another project I suggest you to use and install, Red Elk, which is designed to monitor your red team infrastructure. So you can exactly understand the blue team behaviors as well as you can prepare a simple section of the report for only these observations. My motivation behind of uh, Patak development was slightly simple. I needed a custom C2 that should have no signature, no bad code by default, but on the way, able to demonstrate some features of .NET. I was also giving some offensive C-sharp development trainings as well, so I needed a code that I can sacrifice, send to public, as well as easy and a kind of MSDN uh, sample. So almost all the code examples are coming from MSDN or another documentation. It's nothing optimized. That's why it's called weirdo. However, it is effective because it worked in some purple team exercises uh, well. Also, it is helping me to develop some additional components. And that's why I prefer to still keep this environment, uh, Patak Framework, for my future uh, research as well. It doesn't have all command and control features such as your safeguards, such as restricting the system, restricting the victim, or something like that. It doesn't have anything like dump passwords or uh, let's say upload a file or something like that. It relies on the other .NET projects. For example, GhostPack developed by SpectreOps teams. It's a really good project and GhostPack will give you some really good .NET applications that would be used for situational awareness or more. Also, this .NET gives me another option, which is learning more about the Windows internals as it has almost direct access to Windows API, just like to manage the application. But coding style is slightly easier. That's why I prefer to use .NET. Also, my future projects will be kernel research, and I prefer to use a command and control system for it. Patak comes with two different types of channels. One is implant to C2 channel, which is a real-time web socket on HTTP as well as HTTPS. As .NET has some development uh, certificate issues or something like that, you will struggle to set up HTTPS. But if you remember the C2 slide, we need to use a reverse proxy in front of it to protect Patak as well. That's why I suggest you to deploy all production level certificates, rewrite rules, and reverse proxy, reverse proxy rules all of them on the reverse proxy software. So you can filter out all unwanted traffic. The web socket gives us a kind of real-time like communication. Implant implant channels are also required for lateral movement. It supports up to eight levels of implant connections. An implant can connect to another implant using SMB name pipes, TCP, or UDP. And this may go like that again, 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 go on, go on. All implants can connect to each other. So simply you can connect to multiple levels of networks, but it will be seamless on the interface. Operator will see all of them connected. But if you get sessions or uh, route commands, you may see that what is connected and through what. Also, it has a skeleton communication socket uh, for easy channel extensions. So if you don't like WebSocket, you can add a new one easily. If you have WebRTC implementation, you can just merge it there. If you, if you don't like TCP or UDP or SM name pipes, you can add another one. That's the actual idea of uh, Patak as well. I have some requirements to de uh, develop some certain protocols 
to demonstrate the real life adversaries. They use encryption. So I implemented an encryption, which can be easily bypassed if you have the hard coded AES encryption key, which is already in the implant. But it is there to avoid the network based detections. I'm not messing with the blue team because we are trying to train them. That's the point. For additional channels, I have a few things in my uh, to do list. For example, AWS S3 or DynamoDB or Blobs as command and control channels, as well as adding some Azure support there and maybe replacing AES with uh, TLS uh, handshakes. Also, there are some lateral movement and um, internal communication alternatives. Um, based on this fact, sometimes uh, if I can find some additional free time for it, I can add AD or exchange uh, internal communication channels as well. They are actually used in the wild by those adversaries. That's why Patak helps me to develop those custom channels to simulate the adversary the threat actor as is. Implant itself has some capabilities. As the C2 software doesn't have additional uh, command and control features such as multi-user or timestamping everything uh, or uh, adding additional safeguard and mo uh, monitoring features for the operator, but that doesn't have any of those. And it gives you access to the implant directly. So you choose the implant and after that, all the commands you give are going to the implant directly. So all features are implemented on implant itself. That's why all these capabilities are related to the implant instead of the service itself. It has capability to link some other implants as well as listen to a certain port for linking. So you can use the same implant to create your Matryoshka network an implant connecting to another one, and another one, and another one. It has some uh, additional features for you as you may need as an operator. For example, it may start a process with arguments. Generally, we use this for CMD, PowerShell, or another process on the remote system that you can run. It can also work with .NET because it is a .NET application, and it gives you an interactive .NET shell. Simply whatever you type, ending with, of course, semicolon, can be compiled and run in memory without touching any anything on disk. So simply, you can use this to bypass any argument monitoring or command monitoring software. It may also compile the source code you have shared with it and run it with the arguments you have also given. Also, it may compile some uh, additional source code um, as it uses actually uh, .NET to compile. I think it may compile more than C Sharp, but I haven't tested it. It may invoke any .NET assembly if the running .NET assembly version is matching. Also, it has shellcode invoke as well. It uses a process injection but it simply uses process create in suspended mode and it spoofs the parent ID and then adds the shell code as a, a new thread and it uses Q user APC. In addition, it has also lateral movement feature for WMI exec. So whenever you need to use a lateral movement in a different way, WMI uh, would help you to run this. Of course, internal Windows tools can be used for it as well. For example, scheduled tasks or SC. In future, not these days, um, it will have some evasion techniques as well. Currently still under development, I have some uh, codes for uh, ETW bypass, uh, some uh, AV and EDR bypass, but you can easily add them. It's, it's quite easy because there are some samples in the wild. Um, actually, uh, several people are developing uh, different tools and uh, different techniques for ETW bypass or EDR bypass or AV bypass. Currently, 
but that looks like a clean code and it is not identified by any um, EDR yet directly, but soon it will be. So I suggest you to replace the Patak word in the source code, replace it with something different, as well as start removing the features which could be used as a kind of signature before those features uh, landing. If you need to add ETW bypass or AV bypass, you can make them functions, for example, MC uh, scan buffer bypass or um, ETW bypass uh, just before the executable starts. I'm also planning to add um, additional .NET CLR uh, components for unmanaged processes. So it will give me additional options. Currently, Patak can run the .NET applications to extend the features to run in line or as a thread. But through this feature, it may be able to uh, run the .NET assembly given on a remote process, an unmanaged process. Simply the DLL uh, injected will be loading the CLR and running the .NET code given. I haven't implemented it yet, but there are uh, examples in the wild, so you can easily add this as a capability and uh, pull requests are appreciated. I'm also experimenting some other features, um, some Mobius, Iron Python, and uh, some other scripting languages. Dynamic DLR and uh, Silent Trinity uh, are really good projects for that. And I suggest you to check Silent Trinity for it. It has a lot of good stuff there for uh, dynamic uh, scripting languages on .NET. In addition, um, Covenant, as well as uh, recently published Sharp C2 by Rasta Mouse, uh, covenant by Ryan and uh, uh, Silent Trinity by um, Marcelo, I think. Um, they are really good tools and they have some really advanced capabilities and probably it will uh, it will be a better idea to use them. Um, but again, Patek is there for some experimental features. So try it or not, it's up to you. I will also add uh, some different standalone modules or maybe integrated modules for process injections. And as everybody knows, uh, there are several different types of process injections. And uh, last year there was a Black Hat talk about uh, process injections again, and a tool has been released uh, named uh, Pinjectra. And uh, it demonstrates simply uh, more than a dozen uh, injection techniques. Uh, based on that talk as well. Uh, so I'm, I prefer to implement all of those uh, in uh, different combinations as well as mapping them to Mitra attack TTPs uh, in .NET. I'm not sure when the, this uh, side project would end uh, or maybe there are already uh, good alternatives out there. Uh, so feel free to integrate these kind of tools to Patak as well. And one final thing, I'm planning to uh, work on the kernel space and working on some driver issues. And that's why Patak may um, may receive some uh, kernel level uh, features soon as well, such as uh, loading drivers, manipulating drivers, or um, implementing some uh, features in uh, driver level. So uh, keystroke uh, logging or uh, screenshots or something like that, uh, they can be implemented in uh, kernel space and then pushing the data uh, and communications through user space, that will be an alternative but still um, it's not clear yet. Patak is a .NET application developed using .NET Core and .NET Framework. Now I will demonstrate its features using an AD environment. But before that, I need to remind you, there's a cheat sheet I already pushed to the repository which already gives you some sample commands that you can run for certain tasks, for example, initial execution or other code execution features, lateral movement features, or implanting plant linking. As a brief info, Patak has two components, one for service, one for implant. And this is what we are planning to use now. .NET Core component, which is service, will need .NET Core 2.2 to run. Implant 
is developed using .NET Framework. 4.0 would work fine, but if you need to go to an older version, you may need to remove some of the features or you may need to patch it. The configuration is in two different files. For the service itself, it is launch settings. For the implant, it's configuration CS. Implant does also accept the command line parameters, regardless of how you compile. In our demo environment, there is a user, Padme, running on a system Mandalo, and we will deploy the Patek implant. Let's see Patek service and Patek implant in action and how we deploy this. First of all, we need to run Patek service. Before running, I'm just pointing out that this is the application URI and it simply shows what ports to listen and for what. In this case, 443 for SSL and HTTPS, and port 80 is for HTTP and plain text, which means we can change these IPs as well as ports. This may be required for your cloud deployment. Patek service is a .NET application. That's why .NET run will compile this application as well as run it. This is your service site. So if we go uh, to our environment, this is Patek service. We need to deploy Patek implant to Mandalo and user Padme, which is here. And Padme has virus protection on, which is Windows Defender, and she doesn't have any administrative privileges at all. So if we see any Defender related activities, that's normal because it is enabled. So all these uh, demo actions will be on systems which have Windows Defender enabled. We need to actually compile our implant first. The implant does have a configuration C sharp source code. I'm currently in the Patek implant folder and configuration CS simply shows that there's a URI embedded here. So this implant will try to connect to that URI. This is my IP address, but not yours. So please make sure that you change this. This is one of the requests I receive uh, very often. Why Patek implant doesn't connect to the service? It doesn't because you haven't changed your IP address. Simply it connects to me. But as this is a kind of internal network, and uh, which is uh, my VMware network, uh, it's not able to connect. That's why you see that it is trying to achieve to C2 server, but it couldn't manage it. C2 proto is the default protocol, and currently it's WebSocket because the implant will connect to the C2. If you change this to SMB, TCP, or UDP, Instead of connecting to C2, it will listen to a certain service or name pipe for linking. That means it is there for implant to implant linking. It is generally used for lateral movement or internal deployments. You can give all these as command line parameter as well. Name pipe and listen to ports, they are here as by default ports. To compile, I use CSC, but you can use Visual Studio or Mono or some other applications there as well. Be careful about what .NET framework you target. You can repurpose or retarget this source code for your certain requirements as well. Currently it is 4.0 uh, and .NET framework. Even uh, some part of code uh, may require 4.5 as well, but it works well on Windows 10 by default. So for Windows 7, you may have issues or older Windows 10s. Now we have two Windows 10 and two Windows 2019. This one is 
Active Directory Domain Controller, Coruscant. This one is Navu, the Exchange Server. This one is Mandalore and Padme logged on. And this one is Geonosis and Anakin is logged on. Currently, I'm compiling this binary as Patak Implant Exe on temp folder. Now I can copy this executable elsewhere to run. But generally, we don't deploy malware like that. As it's a .NET application, there are several ways to deploy this. As I previously mentioned, we can hide the .NET implementation or code in different code segments, or maybe even we can use a uh, LOL binary, trusted binary, or we can use the internal Windows tools to deploy this .NET code. As it does not have any bad things inside yet, it won't be an issue. But Patak will be a known code soon, as well as will be blocked. That's why I suggest you to replace the words of Patak in all these repositories. Now, I suggest to compile and copy the file under Patak service. This is what I do for this kind of test environments. In production, don't do that. But you can use the cache style HTTP server uh, in Patak service to also serve files as well. And I serve my executable as index.html in this case. So whenever I request the URI itself without WS, which is mapped to web service. If I ask like this or like this, it will give the index HTML, which is actually the binary, the .NET assembly. So I need to deploy this. There are several ways to do that, as discussed. What I will use currently, a simple PowerShell. This line can be easily replicated through DD macros or .NET to JS or um, Cactus Storage, Tiki Torch or uh, Install Digital MS Build, whatever you prefer to. Simply, I'm using PowerShell to deploy it. I just clicked it and I received these events. So I'm just moving this away and we are looking at this network. To keep this in mind, our network is here. Padme is here, and Padme is connected to our service using WebSocket. What do we have here? We have the implant, and I'm using it using the command use. If you use help here, because this help will directly go to the implant, it will give you a help screen. The help screen will give you a brief idea of what commands are useful. But remember that there is already a cheat sheet MD here in the Patak C2. And you can already have your own samples. So what we need to do today is simply implementing our Padme like that and demonstrating the other connections, implant implant connections on the other systems. So let's do some situational awareness activities on Padme. One of those is exec. Exec is a command to run a process. Most common process is CMD exec, but you can also use calc. When you do that, as you see, the process will start with the parameters given. But remember one thing. The process may take time, and that's why Patak needs to wait for it. Instead of waiting, you can also use this, which will do the same thing, but the new uh, request will be started as a thread of the main process. That means Patak won't wait for the output. That's the main difference between exec an exec thread. This is implemented for almost all the Patak features. Exec, thread, sharp assembly, exec, 
thread exec uh, sharp uh, exec thread sharp code or something like that. So this is the difference between. So simply we can run even PowerShell like that as well. So I'm just moving the screen to avoid any issues. This is the exit PowerShell. That means the PowerShell runs this command set given and gives the output to us, just like the username. If you need more for situational awareness, you can get, for example, get variable, which will give you some environment variables to be used in this PowerShell context. For example, the home directory of the user or what PowerShell features we have. Another good part, as I previously mentioned, is simply exec sharp direct, which is right here. Console write line hello as you see it said hello simply attack compile this line in memory and it did run it if you have concerns about there is an ad or sysmon or event tracing based on the arguments and the processes uh, process starts this will be cut as PowerShell started with an argument. But if you use this, exec sharp direct, it will compile a .NET code given and it will run a .NET code. You don't need to compile everything. Just treat this like you have a C sharp shell here. For example, you can use some C sharp Features, for example, principal windows identity, get current name, which is Galaxy Padme. Or you can use something like that as well. System net DNS and get host name, which is Mandalore. So it's a .NET. But it also has some additional features, as I previously mentioned. Exec sharp code is one of those. It simply compiles the shellcode given, but not shellcode. It is shellcode, which means actually C sharp file. So shellcode can be delivered using two different ways. Please don't get confused with exec shellcode and shellcode. Shellcode will give us the source code itself to compile and run. Exec shellcode is there for process injections. Sometimes you will need native unmanaged applications or other C2s. If that's the case, we may need some process injections. Unless you are probably safe. If you need process injections, probably you will get caught anyway. That's why I will just show first a C sharp code to compile. I will give one example. In my example, Patak service has a www root, and in www root, I have some files. The index.html is the .NET assembly, as we discussed, but there are some other tools I put here as examples. Seatbelt is a well known tool and uh, developed by Spectrop guys, uh, Spectrop guys, as a part of Ghostpack. And uh, it's the same uh, as well. Uh, Hamjoy has developed those, uh, Sharp Up, for example. And now we have a source code here, which is shellcode invoke source code which is a .NET code. It may look like a garbage data for you because it is pretty much like that. Some code mangled through different MSDN resources and some samples code on the web. And this sample code 
as QUser APC process injection. It accepts main, and if the parameter demo is given, it uses a shellcode hard coded, which is calc shellcode to run here, any of those with no stance. But as a part of the static analysis, it may get caught. To avoid this, I put replace me here. When decoding this base 64, the replace me will be replaced with now. So simply the shellcode will be here and it will have shellcode as byte array and it will do process injection. If you don't need to use demo, you can also use raw URL parameter to give a certain URL that has a certain shellcode. So this simply, this shellcode invoke, sharp code, is there for injection, a process injection, using the hard-coded shellcode or a given shellcode. Let's deploy this. Its location is under tools, and I'm using the parameter of URL, and it is demo. The demo is the parameter. So if the demo hits, it runs the shell code of calc. As you see, it compiled and ran the shell code. But again, if you remember, the defender is still running. In a normal exercise, a purple team exercise, if you use this, probably .NET uh, source code will be identified as .NET source code. To avoid this, you can encode the source code using base64 and instead of URL you can use base64 encoded URI. So that will work for you if you like. Another feature uh, we generally use is .NET assembly. As I mentioned that Patak relies on the other .NET tradecraft in the wild. It has capabilities to run .NET assembly in line as well just like the Cobalt Strike Execute Assembly, or Covenant, or Silent Trinity, or Sharp C2. So exec sharp assembly is the command we can use. But remember that if you use exec thread, it will be a thread. Otherwise, it will be a process, a thread running, and our attack will wait for it. If it will take ages, it needs to wait for ages. That's why, if it is not a simple application, I prefer to use exec thread. If it is a simple application to get the output, I prefer this. The executable is .NET executable. It's same. This time not source code. It is .NET assembly, a compiled executable. And the parameter is still same. Demo. And it, again, pops out to calc because it is hard coded. But there is another application here, which is generally used for situational awareness, seatbelt. Seatbelt can be also used like this. For example, exec sharp assembly URL and the URI, which has seatbelt. Remember one thing here, the dead URI is currently a URI served through Patak service. I don't suggest to do that again, but in this example, I'm using Patak as web service. In a real life exercise to track and cover your uh, actually activities, you need to deploy these executables with some external encoded uh, content and in some trusted services such as GitHub, Twitter, or elsewhere, but definitely not on your C2. In this case, I'm running it and giving the basic info. And as you see, basic OSI information after the banner of seatbelt. And we have this. If you run this as all, it will give all the seatbelt options. As a part of our exercise, we may also run CMD as well right here, cmd exec. For the parameters perspective, slash c 
does not require a space afterwards, but most of the argument parsers seek for a space, try to parse it. And that's why sometimes for older EDRs or AVs, this may not ensure. I simply list the directory content of users, Padme, and desktop. As you see, there is a password text here, and I simply get this password text content. As you see, there is a credential set here. I put it there because in a real purple team or red team exercise, we generally have credentials exposed. Most of the users have this kind of credentials on their desktops or their network shares or their internal data share environments. That could be Jira, Confluence, Bitbucket, GitHub repository, source code repositories. It's a very common issue. I just simply simulated this using a text file. So the text file has a username and password for us. So how we can use this? So we can use some other stuff, for example, lateral movement techniques such as WMI, or we can use this for privilege escalation. I will try to use this for lateral movement. Before that, I will show also the shellcode injection before lateral movement starts. I will also demonstrate the shellcode and process injection as well. Exec shellcode can inject the shellcode to a remote process. The given shellcode can be base64 encoded. So again, as you see, the shellcode given was count. But through this way, you will be all right for the payload perspective, but you won't be all right for the process injection type, even though it is Q user APC and parent, uh, parent process ID is spoofed. It's a well-known technique and it will get caught. That's why be careful for shellcode injections. Instead, I prefer you to stick on the .NET tradecraft, or if you like to use PowerShell for simulations, stick on PowerShell as well. Another way is also using LOL beans, LOL beans. So simply living off the land and you can use some executables, trusted and signed, and you can bring them in and use them, or you can use the existing software on the remote system, but not through injections. Now we need um, some additional actions. If you do all these activities on your one single implant, you may lose your implant. We haven't get caught by Windows Defender, even though process injection exists but we might have killed. The problem there is the EDR does not see us yet. In near future, Patek will be a malicious software and even we won't be running uh, like this comfortably. That's why we may need to deploy another implant on the same server, same system, and then link it using another channel internally and then do some activities we have done some situational awareness activities on padme and we have lateral movement requirement on coruscant and we need to deploy multiple implants out there so let's start with coruscant and lateral movement and then deploy new implants and linking WMI exec is a part of lateral movement techniques we used. This command simply uses a feature integrated to Patak, which is WMI execution. It's command execution. So any command given here to create a new process can create a new process for us. The galaxy is the domain user in this case administrator as we found in the credential leaked password is password for and host ids here i assume that you have 
received a kind of uh, port scan output or you used seatbelt to get the domain controller IPs or some other files. So that part is not integrated to FATAC. It's a third party component. Now finally, command. Command simply says that whatever you put here will be running on the remote service to create a new process. The process given here is PowerShell and the parameter uh, set given is for loading an assembly. In this case, Mandalore is trying to get command execution on Coruscant. The commands are startup code. So after this command, we will see that this URI, which is our service, will be used to download an assembly and load this assembly using system reflection assembly and calling the entry point with no parameters given. This means the default will be running. That means also Coruscant will connect to our service directly without linking. Let's do that. So debug also says that this is the data it parsed. And this is the command and it is processing. So it connects to the Coruscant for Win32 process create call. And we will receive a debug notice here and saying that, yes, Win32 process call create is successful or not. Meanwhile, let's log on to this system and see what's going on. Yeah, we received an EV implant. An EV implant is registered and this is the log file. Another thing is, there may be some additional implants giving you output while you are not using them. Then everything is going to log. So if you go to the logs of this file, I'm going here. This is the Patek service back again. There is log folder here. So if I do this, as you see, the file is here. If you look at the content of the file, it says that this is the implant ID. Currently, this feature is not in use. I'm connected at this time. And this is the socket ID. And this is the initial information. So let's go back. Because we didn't link anything. We just asked it to run a certain command. And that command actually was our deployment code. And we received a new implant. So we can use another thing here, actually. For example, this system connected to us. But I'm going back to Mandalore again for the implant I use here. And I'm actually going for the logical diagram to get an assembly named pipe, OK? To do that, you can still use the same deployment, WMI exec, but this time you give some parameters to the .NET assembly to run, TCP and 8005. That means the assembly will be downloaded from our service and to run with these two parameters given, which will listen to TCP port 8005. Let's run this and wait for it. I'm on the domain controller now to show you what's going on there. It says create up. Okay. And okay, using multiple operating systems, come with a weakness. Yeah, right here. It is listening to a certain port, but we haven't linked it yet. Do we have any sessions on Padme? No. Any root? No. So let's link it. Link command is like this. 
it works with URI parsing. It simply says that here, connect to a certain TCP port. So there's an implant waiting here. This is the IP address of the remote system, and this is the port. Let's use this. Okay, we have received a lot of information here. So what we received here is first, implant linking started, session edit, there's a new session, log created, and implant registration is done, and done. Do we have any sessions connected to this implant? Yes. Okay. Let's go back. List it. Okay, we have now three different connections. This is the same system we have used, the domain controller, just like the other one. It is the same. The connection types are different because one of those is linking like that using TCP in this case. I will also uh, create another one for SMB as well for you. And also, it is connected to us. Let's try another one for this time using SMB. We are giving the same command. Let's try this. This should this should work just like the previous one, but this time we should receive a simple name pipe. Okay, we have the code working so we need to understand is there any name pipe i opened powershell and i used get child item name pipe find string of exchange server one yeah that's the thing we are listening to two different name pipes, one for input, one for output. This is also another implementation weakness. I can implement both of those on the same socket, but I need to implement callbacks for it. And uh, I'm lazy, so I didn't implement this. Another challenge here is normally, as a part of this domain, Padme's user rights is sufficient to connect to the IPC dollar share of this server. So linking will be possible, but if Mandalore will be a standalone system and Padme will be a local user, not a domain user, linking won't be possible unless the service start will have changed a registry key for null IPC connections. As this is not the case, for linking, please be careful that this linking type is exactly what you are looking for it is useful for internal network but if you don't have any access to the remote system it may be an issue for example in this case it linked the smb pipe for us so we technically we technically received an smb name pipe connection like that to the core sound Simply the session is here. If that will be a standalone system, but we still have credentials, what you will do is using NetUse, remote systems IP address and IPC dollar, and username and password to map an IPC dollar, then you can link it. Otherwise, the link will be an issue. Another workaround is using TCP, just like I used previously. So we have connections now from the same coruscant using TCP, SMB, and WebSocket directly. 
You can add more here as well. It's, to it's totally up to you. In this case, I will add more to other systems. If you have Geonosis, and let's try TCP for Geonosis. The command is the same, but this time we can give this command to, for example, our one of Nibian plants, exec who am I, which is Galaxy and Administrator running on this system. But it is linked to Padme, so it is coming through that way. Coruscant, Mandala, and then us. I'm simply telling that this implant can be used to fire up, let's say, port 8006 on another system, which is 101, which is this system, Genesis. So it worked. Let's try to link it. TCP link and it worked. I'm going back and seeing that there is another link right here. Geonosis. So go to Geonosis and try to get some information again. Where am I? Or execmd slash here. IP config. See, they are here. And you have a lot of commands to run this as well. And one final thing, we can also compromise Nabu. And this time, we will use something else, which is UDP. Hmm internal SMB name pipe demonstration. Let's do that first. We already have Padme here. And Padme already has a session connected here, which is our Coruscant session. And this one, the session I gave, but failed. Okay, this is right here. This is here. So this connection is lost for several different reasons. Maybe network connectivity issue, maybe just a coding issue. Uh, as I mentioned in my help documents, Patak has a lot of bugs. So your pull requests, fixing the bugs are uh, welcome. If we need to create another SMB name pipe for another instance of our implant, we can simply do this. Exec thread sharp assembly and using our own URI again and it will download our assembly using sharp assembly. It will load this using load assembly and system reflection. And SMB and office OLE is the SMB name pipes given. If you link this to the local service, link it. Now it is linked. So we have another system here, Office Ole on Mandalo, Padme is our LinkedIn plant. So this is our internal connection. Instead of Geonosis, I replicated this on Mandalo. Another one is Nabu. Nabu is here and we can compromise this using Geonosis. Let's do that. Do we have any? Active Geonosis connection. Let's see. Everything is all right with that. Mm, doesn't look like all right. Let's create a new one on Geonosis and using. It probably we have an issue on this item as it looks like lost. As currently. Mandalor, uh, sorry, Geonosis is connected to that one. We also lost the connection to that one. So we may need to relink everything back again. For now, instead of relinking, I will just use again Padme to demonstrate this. And this time using UDP. So 
So instead of Geonosis, I'm connecting from Mandala to Naboo. So I'm not following the plan exactly, as you see. And this is pretty much like any other red team or purple team. You make plans, but things go a bit different. Generally, we have secret controls as well as an active blue team on the other end. So they try to avoid you and some of the issues are triggered through that way. Now, what we expect here is the remote system, which is 10.002, in this case, Naboo, to run this PowerShell code again, which is our installer code. And again, it is pointing to our .NET assembly, but this time, run parameter is UDP and 8005. So simply, we can link it to our Padme again. So we have this kind of linking as well as uh, additional features. And I'm going back to, for example, this part of my back again, and running any other commands we have used. For example, getting the environment username again, or running the seat belt. This is pretty much what we do in a kind of purple team exercise to simulate some activities. The main difference is we follow a certain plan and we try to map every action to certain mitra attack TTPs. That's why in the documentation, I have mentioned that the linking is possible through that way. Lateral movement is possible using this ways, but there are also some alternative TTPs that you can use. And these are TTPs which can be used with the internal Windows commands, such as schedule tasks or copying a remote file. And another one is com objects, distributed com objects. It is similar for initial code segments and run codes as well. Even though it runs some .NET assembly, if assembly is clean and not harmful, nothing is mapping to my attack TTPs. So you need to make it relevant. For example, using safety cast is yet another .NET application, but simply using Mimicast to deploy and run. So it will simply map some certain mitra attack IDs, such as ELSA stamping. And that's it for now. This is a simple demonstration of attack. You can add more code, or you can fix the bugs there as well, or you can run this attack in your own purple team exercises. It is not ready for any uh, production level red team at all. It needs some code fixes as well as some other features. But for purple team, which you may have already access to the client site to demonstrate the trade actor behaviors, you can use. So you may have some um, certain flexibilities using Patak. And it may be used to cover your malicious activities as well. Yeah, that's it. If you have any questions, um, I suggest you to refer to the source code to find some answers or uh, try to find uh, your questions through your own demonstrations. If you still struggle, uh, my Twitter is still on and I will try to help you, but that's not always the case. So I will wait for your feedback. Thank you.